psychic underworld. He has freed himself from superstition, or so he believes, but in the process he has lost his spiritual values to a positively dangerous degree. His moral and spiritual tradition has disintegrated and he is now paying the price for his breakup in a worldwide disorientation and disassociation. We may wonder if the overwhelming success of linear perspective as the sole definition of visual reality isn't a symptom of some deeper condition seeking expression. And we might ask, why did some humans create and then rationalize with elaborate devices, ideologies and defenses an unprecedented way of seeing the world based on distancing and detachment? Could it be that the linear perspective that infuses our vision from our glorification of intellectual distancing to our debunking of earlier realms of feeling and intuition, to our relentless lifting upward with skyscrapers and space shuttles, to the ultimate techno-utopian vision of a downloading human knowledge into self-perpetuating computers to make embodied life obsolete, that such a perception is the result of some traumatic violation that happened in our human past. Again, those familiar with my work on Atlantis know that that is in fact true, that 13,500 years ago and 50 and then before that, we had significant traumatic uh, incidences that caused the predicament that we're in. And the modern historians and sociologists, because of the horrors of our modern world, are starting to put the pieces together and discover this. Uh, Chalice Glenn Denning says that Terry Kellogg emphasizes the fact that abusive behaviors, whether we direct them towards ourselves, other people, or other species, are not natural to human beings. People enact such behavior, behaviors because something unnatural has happened to them and they have become deranged. Hey, but that's all right. We're the monopolies of the world. We got solutions. We're going to make billions and billions of dollars of all of that disenfranchisation and alienation and horror. We're not going to fix it. We're going to drug it. Talking of this uh, bicamerality, which is the splitting of the hemispheres of consciousness, and that bicamerality is, whether you want to phrase it as men from women, or masculine from feminine, or human from nature, or your mind from your own body. Eric Newman is speaking of it. He says, while, for while the specific achievement of the male world lies in the development of masculine consciousness and the rational mind, the female psyche is in far greater degree dependent upon the productivity of the unconscious. So what Jung and Newman are saying here is that the feminine, another word for it, is basically the unconscious. And as scientists like Bruce Lipton have shown, the unconscious is 99 point something something percent of our consciousness, our psyche. Ego waking consciousness is the smallest part. And eventually, we're going to have what Nietzsche referred to as the return of the repressed. We have the eternal return. We, we're going to have all of the content that we have been forgetting and then forgetting we forgot about it. All those skeletons in the closet are going to be coming back, either projected onto other people, coming back that way, um, which we talked about in uh, Weapons of Mass Deception, or in a more um, pernicious, homegrown way. But either way, it's coming back. Um, the skeletons in the closet will come back. Bradley Pask, in his book Rape and Ritual, says, the depreciation and loathing of women, of woman, her body, and by extension the feminine, has been expressed repeatedly by our intellectual and psychological forefathers. St. Peter in the Gospel of Thomas is heard to say, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Tertullian, the patriarch, a church father, says, woman, you are the gateway of the devil, because of you the Son of God had to die. J.A.C. Brown in Techniques of Persuasion gives us an uh, insight, an example, into what happens when you um, suppress your libido in such a pernicious way. In the meeting, this Calvinist revival meeting, which followed in 1801, 20,000 men, women, and children assembled our doors and listened to the doctrine of hellfire and eternal damnation for the unrepentant. Almost immediately, excitement broke out. Some ran about shrieking in agony or rolled on the ground for hours at a time. Others rushed into the surrounding forest crying, lost, lost, at the full pitch of their voice. Convulsive jerking movements began amongst many and spread like a contagion throughout the congregation and elsewhere. Groups of men and women went, in, went through the process known as treeing the devil, where they crawled around on all fours, barking and snarling at each other for long periods of time. Another phenomena was the so-called frog hopping, when both men and women occupied themselves by frenziedly 
leapfrogging over each other. As might be expected, many of the, in the final phases of the meeting went into trance or had visual hallucination and ended up by taking part in sexual excesses. And of course, we have um, the Roman Catholic Church well involved in those excesses in today's world. We know, as some people have said, that the, uh, forgive me for echoing it, that the Roman Catholic Church is nothing but a um, hostel for pedophiles. Not originally it wasn't like that, but look what it's become. He gives another example. He says, in 18th century France, in a convent, one nun began to mew like a cat until presently the whole community was mewing day after day, until stopped by the threats of the local militia and the biting mania which spread through the convents of Germany, Holland, and Italy. In the latter case, powerful excitement manifested itself not only in biting, but in indecent exposure, tearing the hair out by the roots, and group howling and gnashing of teeth. And if you think these uh, two examples are the only ones, think again. There are literally thousands of such examples. Martin Luther, in a statement in his own works, you can see the uh, level of the psychosis. He says, when my heart is cold and I cannot pray as I should, I scourge myself with the thought of the impiety and ingratitude of my enemies, the Pope and his accomplices and vermin, so that my heart swells with righteousness and hatred, and I can say with warmth and vehemence, holy be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And the hotter I grow, the more ardent do my prayers become. That might sound outrageous to you living here in America, uh, coming from Belfast, it's completely understandable. When you see the atrocities in any of these countries, which is done under the name of religion, you know, it quickly dawns on you that there's something seriously wrong. We have St. Augustine in the same predicament. He says, Meanwhile, my sins were being multiplied and my concubine being torn from my side as a hindrance to my marriage. My heart, which clave unto her, was torn and wounded and bleeding. To thee be praise, glory to thee, fountain of mercies, I was becoming more miserable and thou nearer. John Edwards, the New England fanatical preacher, says that God, the God that holds you above the pit of hell, much as we hold a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. Uh, John Edwards is uh, also making his inherent sadism, very clear in the following passage, he says, as innocent as children seem to us, if they are out of Christ, they are not so in God's sight, but are young vipers and are infinitely more hateful than vipers and are in a most miserable condition. Funny that, I remember reading the Gospels, I didn't hear Jesus mentioning any of this. Well, that's the condition of the sadist. Somebody who's so tortured and traumatized inside that in order to find the release, he has to murder whole nations, whether they're kings or countesses or political tyrants. It really doesn't make any difference, whether it's the uh, local sadistic serial killer raping lunatics you find in the world. We all have it inside. Niccio Machiavelli, he said, since love and fear can hardly exist together, if we must choose between them, it is far safer to be feared than loved. And that's the predicament we're in. We don't care for love. We're in a state of fear. We don't care what leaders tell us to rise up under the name of patriotism and a flag and go and murder innocent children and women. But that's all right. We're in such a state of chaos inside. We need to create chaos in the world so that our particular sadism and violence is less noticeable. You know, it's like camouflage. And it all works. And we are, even if you're passive, even if you're a well-meaning detractor and you say, no, I'm not, I don't believe in all of that. Ah. But have you observed the way that you're cruel to yourself? Have you observed the nature of how your own psyche, your own dynamic works? Have you understood the nature of shadow work and projection? That yes, you may openly, consciously say, oh, that's just horrific, I can't stand that, these people are terrible. But have you noticed what it is within your own psyche that maybe it's, in a, it's so minute you don't notice it, that creates this kind of scenario in your life? And that all the things that you think are horrible about your life that you have manifested them, you're bringing them in? Because as Carl Jung said, did he not, that that which you do not make conscious becomes fate. Mental energy has a strange, bizarre, almost mysterious and certainly inexplicable way of conspiring with physical energy. So that which you do not process within yourself becomes the very fate that meets you.
at the front door, forcing you to deal with it. You take that to the global level, and it explains a lot. Now, Leonard Slane said, the Babylonians elevated to the supreme position a god who had conquered and then mutilated a goddess. So the original Babylonians were all into this. Leonard Slane says, patriarchy is the dominant theme in Hammurabi's code. Sons are commanded by their, to obey their fathers, not their mothers. Hammurabi's code was the first law that was ever set down by any civilization or culture. Of course, now you need laws. In fact, now you need money, you need clocks, you need walled cities, you need a meat diet, you need to suppress uh, the women, you've got to conquer your enemies. Uh, all of this stuff coming out of the post-historic or the uh, Asia Minor, all these citadels, bloodthirsty empires. Well, if you're not going to connect to nature, you've got to have something to do. Eric Newman on the moon and the matriarchal consciousness he says, any development at any stage that strives towards patriarchal consciousness, towards the sun, looks on the moon spirit as the spirit of regression, as the terrible mother, as a witch. Leonard Schlein says, when asked, most men will gallantly express their admiration for women in general and profess a profuse love for their mates in particular. Despite these touching personal testimonials, society is rife with misogyny and patriarchy. A cursory glance at the current newspapers or television reveals news reveals a global society in which the majority of main men disdain women. While some cultures are more egalitarian than others, men's actions suggest that they believe firmly in their superiority over women. So admit it, you feel superior over women. Next question, why do you feel that way? And the journey of self-realization begins. Is it because you feel inferior in yourself? Is it because you know that they are merely external representations of your own inner feminine? I mean, we've got answers, and as I've been saying all along, they're quite simple. And this is the way to healing. But you've got to start from somewhere. And as we brought out more clearly in 2012, the leaders of the world, those who are expert at steering the ship of state and who have their fingers on the pulse of the psyche of mankind, know uh, epoch to epoch when it is that the pressure is building up. And they know exactly how to create the nemesis. In fact, these leaders of the world, uh, they are the manifestation of all of this subconscious repression and toxic debris, this quality. And uh, they know how to work with the shadow. And they know how to play Big Daddy. Just like the Big Daddy of the Old Testament, the original Big Daddy, Jehovah. He didn't um, make the Israelites chosen because of their rare and unique uh, genius to go around building pyramids. He didn't uh, uh, make them chosen because of their great strength uh, militaristically, and ar uh, that they were a great army or because they were great humanitarians or anything like that. No. A bunch of commandments were handed down and they strictly obeyed it. They were protected, they were secure, and they were made the chosen people because they were obedient servants. It works with the same master philosophy we find today. And as we said in 2012, the master who can kill you, who's dominant over you, would you not rather become a slave than to be killed. So the slave realizes that his master will kill him. So he has no alternative but to willfully become his slave. But hatred and vengeance and attraction repulsion, you see, passive aggression, is the basis of that master-slave dynamic. In anywhere it's found, I don't care if it's found in your front room, in your husband and wife relationship, or with your children, or with your neighbors, or up at the, at the workplace, or on the state level. It's the same dynamic no matter where it manifests. And even religiously in your relationship to your God. Now, those leaders, those masters who suppressed you, who make you a slave, they understand that even though you act in certain ways and you smile and you go about your business, there's hatred involved. So over time, not immediately, but over time, the leaders come to hate themselves. And then we've got another wave of hatred that not somehow, somehow needs to be expatiated, needs to be exercised. If you track this, what I'm talking about, with the rhythm of history and the cycles of the epochs of history, things will start to make sense. And we'll be able to account for why the graveyards and the mausoleums actually exist. And why nothing ever seems to change. In uh, my other work, I write that in stark juxtaposition to the male's inner psychic ambivalence towards the female, but arising from his marked estrangement from his own inner feminine animus, and anima, that should be also, we shouldn't forget that, 
is his chronic infatuation with the physical female and her body. This interest, whether erotic or other, is largely based on the compensation for the lost rapport with nature, the essence of which he cannot fathom, circumscribe, or make subservient to his dark secret love. That's to use a term from William Blake. Due to his relative ontological inferiority, man aspires to conquer physical women, and those women who lend themselves to such ardors become party to the crime of the dark secret love, which replaces the authentic but rarer expression. Ah, so the waters become even murkier now. We have man being estranged from his own feminine, but then as a compensation, the ego will allow, of course, a gratification, a totally um, over-fixated emphasis on the physical form. You're not going to have the real thing, okay? You're not going to have the core issue here. But don't worry, we'll sell you the product, the shell, the headless female. We'll sell you the, you know, the, the whole California beach lie through magazines and films and posters and pornography and whatnot. Eh, we'll give you that in a replacement, remember? The surrogate replacement. And the women who go, yay, this is good for business, will buy into all of this, become party to not only their own estrangement, but to the seduction of the whole of the world and the loss of the real rapport. And we're, that's why we're not picking on men here. We have to understand we're talking about masculine and feminine. Are the women are going to accept that they have tremendous built up over not only their personal lives, but over the whole uh, historical life, the social life, an immense hatred of the male, probably very justified as we've been seeing. My goodness, we could make a whole theme of female hatred for the male just out of what we've been presenting in this uh, very presentation. So yes, okay, it's justified, but that doesn't mean that the whole earth and the world and man and woman has to suffer now. We are human beings, we can take responsibility for that. Is the individual female going to examine the hatreds that she has for the, for the male and the ways that she subtly tells herself, oh no, I don't have any such thing. I'm completely balanced and adjusted. Is the male going to look at all his um, sordid content towards the mother? And are we going to listen to these brothers and sisters of humanity like Carl Jung and Dr. Sigmund Freud and Dr. Wilhelm Reich and get on with solving and fixing the problem? Or are we just going to leave it to everybody else? The psychologist Karen Horney who's made a great deal of uh, research into this matter and also into the child psychology, she says, are love and death more intimately bound up with one another for the male than for the female? Does the man feel side by side with his desire to conquer a secret longing for extinction in the act of reunion with the woman or the mother? So here we got again, dissimilar drives coming together. What Plato thought could never happen Sigmund Freud and Horney and the Freudians and the Jungians, no, absolutely it can happen. This similar drives crossing circuits. You absolutely despise your big daddy uh, leader inwardly, but you're so threatened by his presence because you know he can kill you that you've only got two ways to rebel. You either rebel, start uh, hitting the streets with tattoos and putting, uh, you know, safety pins through your nose and uh, not getting a job. That's open rebellion. We've all done that. And then there can be identification. But that works even better. I identify with the object of my hate. I'm a female. I hate my father. I hate the state and everything that malehood stands by. But you know, rebelling against it, that's not going to get me anywhere socially. And oh, I all want those goodies that the state can offer me. So guess what I'll do? I'll identify with the object of my hate. I'm the male who hates women or despises women. But I want to cover that up. So guess what I'll do? I'll start becoming a feminist and I'll go and read feminist books and I'll uh, grow my hair out long and pretend I'm a great lover, a great Casanova, a great free uh, liberator of the female. On this subject uh, that Horney's talking about, I also wrote in my articles, by his acts of violence against women and earth, man and the masculine principle seeks more than simple conquest and the exaltation of his own raw physical or mental power. Psychological researchers into the dynamics of religious pathology have uncovered that the compulsive offender, similar to normal rapists and attackers, seeks union with the object of his violence. His acts of terrorism, rape and rage are but affirmations to the inherent strength of that which he marginalizes but subconsciously strives to merge with. However, since union with the feminine theoretically means a diminution of his own libido, and cessation of his inflated identity, his love and bonding expressions become violent and acquisitive. The male psyche is perpetually locked 
within his attraction repulsion and sadomasochistic syndromes. That's right, sacred or profane. She's either the vampire or she's the virgin. The mother of God or that which needs to be destroyed. Now Vladimir Soloviev ties this whole thing back into the connection to nature. It is time when men realized their oneness with Mother Earth and rescued her from lifelessness so that they can save themselves from death. But what oneness can we have with the Earth when we have no such oneness, no such relationship with ourselves? That's right. Forget about bonding with external nature. You are nature. Uh, this is not about tree hugging that we're talking about or joining some new age cult or ashram. You are nature. nature na you are nature's creation. Nature is within you as psychic energy. So when I'm talking in all of this psychological terminology and psychological remedies, I'm talking about the connection back to nature. Your core is the natural order. So trying to skive out of that and run around in the forest and say, oh, I'm close to nature now. Uh, you know, I'm a herbalist and I do this and I do that and I paint my house green and I, I live in a wooden house instead of a brick house and, you know, uh, I use recycled tires and all of this. You know, that, that isn't what we're talking about here. We're talking about a deep and reverent, mystical understanding of the nature of the human psyche and its exact connections between psyche, the energy of the mind, and the natural order, the universal order. Now we can ask a question similar to what the ancients, the way they asked their questions. Why has all this happened and how could the ancients know about it in advance? That has to do with a phenomenon in astrology known as the precession of the equinoxes. Now, to make astronomy and astrology possible, there are three basic celestial cycles or movements to be taken into account. One is the rotation of the Earth around the Sun. Two is the rotation of the Earth on its own axis. And three, the slow wobble of the axis as the Earth turns on its own orbit. Now we also have the 12 signs of the zodiac on the ecliptic. As the sun moves around uh, on a path, that path is known as the ecliptic. And the sun moves backwards through each of the 12 signs very gradually, very slowly. And that path that we call the ecliptic also crosses with another uh, orbital path, which is known as the celestial equator. But this uh, event in astrology and astronomy, known as the precession of the equinox, is when the sun, by moving backwards through the signs, makes the constellations themselves appear to be moving in the opposite direction, or westward. Now the sun moves literally through the 12 signs in a massive, gigantic circle. And of course, as it moves, it appears that the background of stars moves the other way. Due to the wobble of the axis of the Earth, the Sun, the Moon, the planets, and the constellations appear to move backwards through the 12 signs. The Sun takes 2,160 years to traverse one sign of 30 degrees, moving one degree every 72 years. The entire cycle, that's the time it takes the Sun to go through all the signs of the zodiac backwards, is 25,920 years. This round is known by astrologers and astronomers as the Platonic Year. Now, 2160 is a very important number. 2160 times 6 is 12,960, and that's a number that is found encoded in most all of the sacred megalithic structures and temple complexes of the world. Because we had a stellar cult, as we point out in the program in the series called Astrotheology. So the numbers which are involved in the movement of the stars, I'm just giving you a few examples here, 2160 or 21,160 or any of the permutations of that number, in order to transmit those to Earth, they would encode those numbers or those degrees of arc or those celestial uh, readings. They would encode those into the temple structures so that literally that earthen uh, building or temple would be based on the harmonics and the numbers associated with the movement and relationship of the planets above them. This was how they honored their goddess. Now a processional day is 2,160 years long. 
This is one degree every 72 years for a sign of 30 degrees. And we all know that the signs of the zodiac are 30 degrees. So the sun, in order to move one degree, takes 72 years. That's your key. If, the, if you're coming to this for the first time and it's a bit confusing, just remember that the sun moves one degree of the zodiac every 72 years. To get through 30 signs, 30 degrees of a whole sign, it takes 2,160 or 216 as a code number. 2160, 216. And to go through the entire 12 signs, 25,920. However, this number, 2160, was considered so sacred that its mystery was rarely mentioned to the uninitiated. Instead of it, the number 666 was used because 6 times 6 times 6 equals 216. So when we delve deeply into Freemasonry, secret societies, and uh, the mysteries of sacred geometry and occultism, you'll discover that triad numbers in particular, and even prime numbers and other numbers, were used as cover numbers. I mean, we've already talked about the fact that there was an exoteric and esoteric tradition, and that the, these great secrets were not just handed out. And one cult also wanted to preserve their secrets, and of course they were doing it out of love for their god. These were the secrets of the uh, cult that they were in. So cover numbers were also used. This is what we have to realize when we make a study of something like the Bible, which has got more book numbers in it than uh, most mathematic books. This is the real reason why the Orthodox Christian hierarchy have made this number out to be satanic. It is because it has to do with astrotheology, astrology, and the stellar cult. There's nothing satanic about the number 666. However, it might be referred to, or we could acknowledge, that it is the number of the beast. And to explain what I mean by that, that passage in Revelation 18 where it says, let him who hath understanding reckon, that's calculate the number of the beast, for it's a human number. Well, indeed it is a human number. We find that man is in the womb for nine months. Upon his birth he is forever circumnambulated by the wheel of the zodiac. And for his personal life, for the life of the earth upon which he lives, for light and energy, he needs the outer sun, the center of the zodiac. Nine months is 270 days. The wheel of the zodiac, like all cycles that man will live in, is defined by 360, and the sacred numeral of the sun, which is the battery of it all, is 36. 270 plus 360 plus 36 is 666, the human number. There's no mystery to it more than that. Gestation, the cycle of the zodiac, which inscribes our life. In fact, that's why we have the degree the symbol of the deg a degree is a circle, the ovum symbol, the microcosmic zodiac. You're born at a date of birth. That is a particular degree of arc. The very symbol tells you everything. Additionally, as modern biologists have discovered, the human gene is made up of 23 chromosomes. 23 is a very important number in the ancient world because 3 divided into 2 equals 0 0.666. Incidentally, the number of the sun, 36, if you add all the digits, between 1 and 36. That's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus up to 35 plus 36. It also reaches 666. Now we all know about uh, astrology in the sense that we go and get a little horoscope done for ourselves or a or chart. That's a very interesting thing to go and have done. It's part of what we've been talking about. It's part of the road to self-discovery and to realize how we can correctly and healthily have mental and emotional hygiene is to be involved with the divination arts. But have we also learned that there is a, such a thing as the chart of the Earth? The Earth itself is a key uh, component in astrology. Well, we find that the chart, there is a chart of the Earth. And the rising sign of the Earth, or the ascendant, what they call the ascendant, because of this processional movement, the rising sign of the Earth is presently in the last few degrees of the sign of Pisces, the fishes. Therefore, the descendant, that's the exact opposite sign, the descendant is in the sign of Virgo. The descendant is very important in your chart. The, a lot of astrologers just think the ascendant, the rising sign, is of importance, and your sun sign. But we have a thing called the descendant, which is very important to analyze uh, regarding your character and your nature and your fate and your destiny and what have you. And in the earth, it's no different. And the descendant sign is Virgo. Now, the opposite of the descendant is as important for the chart of the earth as the ascendant is. We cannot understand the times we are living in or those to come unless we're familiar with these astrological oppositions. And there's a tarot connection as well, because card number 9, the Hermit, relates to the sign of Virgo, and card number 18, the Moon card, relates to Neptune 
or to Pisces. There's another chart that will show you, you are in the last degrees, we are, the, the sun is, moving towards the very last degrees of the sign of Pisces, soon to enter into the sign of Aquarius. And as it takes 2,160 years or 30 degrees to go through any of these signs, we call those the ages or the aeons. We, are, we came into the age of Pisces 2,000 and more years ago and we're about to leave it. Now competent astrologers know that the negative traits associated with the sign of Pisces concern deception, vice, hidden agendas, mass delusion, and the misuse of spiritual virtue and power. Now every sign of the zodiac, every color, every symbol or sign, talisman, amulet, nothing is inherently negative. They have both positive and negative traits. But competent astrologers know that Pisces has some very dark um, traits associated with it. So in the age of Pisces, it was to be expected that the world would experience its share of these negatives on the macrocosmic level. As the age of Pisces comes to a close, the deceivers know that the paradigm shift which will occur, which does not favor their machinations, this understanding has led them to make many subtle alterations to their age-old stratagems. The study of and tracking of these expedient accommodations prompted by astromantic and cosmological phase shifts amounts to an entire subject in itself. Meaning that astrologers who really know what they're doing, and who pay attention to this, know that the sun moving through these different uh, houses of the zodiac, the mythographers of the world, those at the echelons of power, they know about it, they study it. They're, after all, the high descendants of the stellar cult. And they are aware that you need to re-script the mythologies for each of these passing ages. In the age of the Taurus, the bull, cows were worshipped, for instance, as the cow in India is still sacred. When the sun moved into the age of Aries, the ram, and everything to do with the horned ram was considered sacred. And that's when we have this whole cult of war. Then when it moved into Pisces, we have the fishermen, and Christ the fisher king, and the Pope with the headdress of the fish and the whole cult of Christianity arising. And we move into Age of Aquarius, they're going to have to re-script and come up with a new mythology to fit it, fit the imagery. And of course, Aquarius rules technology and science. So already we're seeing that coming into ascendancy. The powers that be are handing down to us the whole of the Silicon Revolution and the microchip and many, and also positive things like the inventions, grassroots, inventions and uh, new age technologies. The age of Aquarius coming upon us is also mentioned in the Bible. Uh, John 14, in my father's house are many mansions and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, ye may be also. Now the age of Aquarius begins in AD 2740, although nobody's quite sure that that is uh, accurate. However, as the sun moves towards the final degrees of the previous sign, the descendants of the great cults of power who are at the helm of the religions and governments need to make arrangements for change. As each age terminates, the appointed mythographers have to re get ready to script new mythologies consistent with the complex symbolism of the coming age. Their work is analogous to the Madison Avenue ad man, only their hot product can be summed up as the new world order. And that's right, it's a new world order. We're moving into a new age, a new world. The end of an age is always distinguished by orchestrated chaos and conflagration. This is the meaning of Armageddon. This is why I added this uh, slide. Because we have to understand that it's, it's history, it's fact. As one age comes to the end, we not only have millennial angst to handle, we've got uh, it on a grand scale. And there's an orchestrated what Jordan Maxwell, the great historian and scholar in this matter, talks about the Dionysian age, the Saturnian cult letting loose what the Freemasons refer to as Ordo Ab Chao, unleashing so much uh, nihilism and debauchery and sex, drugs and rock and roll that nobody can think straight anymore to even notice what's going on while they move their address and get ready for the new age to come. But this involves a lot of sacrifices. Now Matthew 13 we hear about the forces that come to end the age. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world.
The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of the fire. Nice religious language there, but remember, take the tone that I've been taking this whole program, the idea that if you convert phraseology like that to the psychological development, take it out of its religious context and understand that what's being talked about here is the releasing of the repressed. We're going to have a time when the masks are coming down and there's going to be an a writing, there's going to be an adjudi adjudication. Now like many of the signs of the zodiac, Aquarius, Aquarius's original feminine symbolism was subverted so that instead of the lady of the urns, we get the man with a water pitcher. That's great, that's very uh, insightful because in Luke 22 we read, and he said unto them, this is Jesus, saying to his disciples, Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This is coming in, John, in Luke when the disciples are saying, you know, you, you're going to die, you're going to leave us, where, you, you know, where are we going to meet you? Where will we meet you, the Son of God, you know, after you've left us? And he's saying, and he said to them, Behold, you enter into the city. And in astrotheology, we heard, we heard that terms like city and city of David and Mount of Olives and Tabernacle, these refer to the constellations and to the zodiac. Go into the city. He's saying, look up to the city and there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. The sun will enter into the sign of Aquarius. The tarot cards themselves, if we understand what they are. The major arcana cards track this process of procession. Remember, as I said, the sun moves through all the houses of the zodiac. Well, just let's take even from Libra, going through Virgo to Leo to Cancer to Gemini to Taurus to Aries and into Pisces. The cards of the major arcana are the little Polaroids for each of those ages. The individuals who designed and created the tarot have this remarkable job of taking one picture and encapsulating 2,160 years of events, experiences, and, and religious, and even the ideas. And they did it. It's successful. It works. Masudi, the 10th century Arabian historian and author, says, On the eastern or great pyramid built by the ancients, the celestial spheres were inscribed. Likewise, the position of the stars and their circles, together with the history and chronicles of past times, of that which is to come and of every future event, also, one may find there the fixed stars and what comes about in their progression from one epoch to another. Perfectly stated, the ancients understood this. Not only could you understand what had come in the past, but they, the ancients, knew what was to come, that there would be an age of iron and tears, where their bequeathments would be thrown to the winds. For instance, the age of Virgo, we said that the age of Virgo is very important in the chart of the earth. It happens to be that in the age of Virgo, the pyramid was constructed. This is why in the present age of Pisces, which is its mirror opposite, antiquarian scholars and speculative laymen have, also, have been so interested in uncovering its secrets. And so it can be for the metaphysical practices also. So that's right. Here we are in the age of Virgo, or sorry, the Pisces, but that faces the age of Virgo many thousands of years ago, in which the pyramid and the Sphinx were built by the ancient Egyptians, our forefathers, who constructed these marvels in stone. And that's why the Piscean, Edgar, uh, Edgar Cayce, predicted that it would be in the age of Pisces that man, we would rediscover or get reinterested in the mysteries of the ancient world, and particularly in Egypt. And we are. This very program and my work with Jordan Maxwell on astrotheology, again, trying to bring this gnosis out to the world, is very much um, evidence of what uh, Edgar Cayce and the prophets were talking about. Because there's nothing new under the sun. And we now need to look back there, not because we just have nothing better to do and you know, we're fascinated by ancient history, but because we're fascinated by what's happening now and we realize that the, our ancestors did things right the first time around because they had the greatest instructress of all, Mother Nature. We've got pornographic-minded politicians raping and mutilating their way through the world. It's your choice. We talked earlier about the return the return full circle, the 21st century. The return to what Egypt took as academic can be referred to 
as a return to the age of magic as opposed to the age of science. But I don't mean in some animistic, you know, turn off, tune out way. When we see the word magic and we think of magic, what is it? How do we define it? We've been defining a lot of terms. Well, magic is loosely, it is anything which deeply and permanently affects us on all levels at once, physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. There's not too many things in the world that do that, but there are some. We all know in our own life what that might be. Additionally, it is also a process of unification. Magic is a process of unification, of synergy. It is also the understanding of the workings of holarchy. Yes, you're a magician. You understand the magic of life when you realize that this whole thing is a fractal, a hologram, a holarchy, and not a hierarchy with an upper and a downer, with an apart and apart. It is the understanding of how to live in accordance with the inviolable ordinances of nature despite your ego resistance. That's magic, an act of magic, realizing that you want to live in harmony with something that's inviolable, but your ego resists it. Learning how to appease both, learning how to use this incredible office manager, this dictatorial and super disciplined and masculine and phallocratic as it is, it's also very needed. You don't club the ego and st uh, stun it with a kick in order to get rid of it or drug it with uh, you know, pharmaceuticals and drugs and pharmaceuticals or even drug it with ideologies. You win it over and then you try to find a way to live in harmony with nature. That's the act of magic. It is learning to attain what is needed without violating the self, the other, or nature. And this means morally. As I said, yes, I'm concerned with the violence and the mayhem that's happening in the world, but I am much more, infinitely more concerned with the violence that goes on in your life every single day. Have you noticed how everything you do or how many things you say bring about hurt and, and horror to yourself, first of all? and then subsequently to others and to nature. How do we operate to get what we need? And I mean get a full, rich life for ourselves without doing that. When we work on that particular thesis, we'll have plenty to be getting on with. And it is learning the difference, as we mentioned earlier, between being and doing. And magic is the uh, learning, the difference between, and the relationship between being and doing, like we saw earlier. These two things need to be fused. We cannot inculcate or awaken the feminine principle without understanding the message of doing, which perhaps the Eastern countries were more familiar with, but we certainly in the West need to re-examine this whole concept. And if you plant something that you want to happen, but you plant it in the wrong ground, if you plant the seeds of being in the ground of doing and vice versa, life will not uh, occur or happen the way you imagine it will. And in a very Socratic way, Alistair Crowley, uh, speaking on this symbiosis and this connection, he says, we see then that we can never affect anything outside ourselves, save only as it is also within us. Whatever I do to another, I also do to myself. If I kill a man, I destroy my own life at the same time. Every vibration awakens all others of its particular pitch. Magic again. The idea that what you do literally does have ramifications. There's an ebb and a flow. There's an absolutely living and vital connection between you and the planet, you and other people, and it all emanates from your relationship with yourself. This is the lodestone, the key theme of the whole uh, movement of magic. In science, you can get away with murder. You can do whatever you want because, of course, we are all working towards hypothetical futures. We believe in progress. We don't need to worry about the mess we're in internally. We just take all our sadism and uh, all of our horror and we say, tomorrow we'll have all the answers. Now this kind of thing that Crowley and the Gnostics have been talking about is really Christianity's core message. Peel away all of the miasma and junk and you basically have at the, at the core of Christianity the same message because we are not here just to debunk, as we said. We're not here just to detract. There is purity within these religions. They can serve a purpose. Once the garbage is swept away and cleaned away, we can have something more pristine. If you have to 
leave it behind completely and move into another phase of thought in life because it's just, it's marred your consciousness so much, so be it. But others working within that system can do great good. This has been shown by Professor Tolkien, who in his book, Lord of the Rings, clearly depicts to us the journey into the underworld and that there's a need to go into the dark and unholy places of the world in order to save humanity and find light and peace and harmony and freedom to yourself. And also C.S. Lewis from Belfast, the great Christian scholar, within the framework, George MacDonald, there's many answers, uh, J., uh, George Russell that we quoted from earlier, and many, many others. In Acts 7, we read, The Most High dwells not in temples made with hands. In 1 Corinthians, you are the temple of God, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And in John 14, the works I do, you can do, and greater. So man is Adam Kadmon, Adam Ka'amon, the sun god, the anthropos. And if he's in perfect order inside himself, which is the act of magic? It's the act of discovering about who you are. And self-realization, say the Vedic people, is necessary before God-realization. Know thyself was written at Delphi. And if you're in harmony, then we can have social harmony. So aware were the ancients that the human being was, in fact, the God incarnate, and that his body was the precise geometrical temple, that they even built their temples, like the famous Temple of Solomon, basing it on the inner architecture of the human mind. From Stedman's medical dictionary, we read that there's an uttermost layer of the brain, the dura mater, the hard mother, is a tough covering that anchors the brain. And there's an outer holy place. That's the outer holy place. Then there's an innermost layer, the pia mater, the tender mother. That's a thin, delicate membrane. And then between these two, between the outer dura mater, the outer holy place, and the inner pia mater, lies a reticulated layer of tissue the arachnoids, whose appearance reminds one of a spider's web. So we have the three chambers, the outer, the inner, and the middle veil, which is found in all sacred temples throughout the world. So there's a law of reciprocity operating in the universe. Aleister Crowley in Magic and Theory and Practice says that anyone who is forced from his own course, either through not understanding himself or through external imposition, comes into conflict with the order of the universe and suffers accordingly. How appropriate, how correct, how perceptive. He's summing up the whole predicament. It doesn't matter whether it's suppression from outside or repression from within. You are alienating yourself from yourself. You are violating the inviolate laws of nature and suffering as a result. Alistair Crowley says in Heart of the Master, the true will must be consciously grasped by the mind. And this work is akin to that called the attainment of the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. In Magic and Theory and Practice, he says, in the knowledge and conversation of his holy guardian angel, the adept is possessed of all he can possibly need. To consult any other is to insult one's angel. We also said that magic was a process of unification. Now the taroscopic approach, or system of divination, synthesizes the great hermetic arts of divination, as the first card of the tarot tells us to do. The high arts of tarot, astrology, cabal, and numerology are the Western magical tradition, and are the means by which we initiate ourselves into our august and sovereign roles, as priests and priestesses, unto ourselves, answerable to no other authority. From the beginning of this program, we've been talking about the need to revisit the Egyptian lore precisely because they had a Western magical tradition. It's our magical tradition. And tarot, astrology, Kabbalah, and numerology. But these are all being taught as separate. They're all considered separate disciplines. They're not united anymore as they used to be in one collegiate, as one academic canon. My work with the taroscopic approach is a very important study of these subjects to find the glue that originally holded them together. And once that is discovered, they can be used for the purpose that they were created, each one being more powerful now because they're linked with the others. Like the card of the first, like the first card of the tarot tells us to do, you see the magician, the magi, the initiator, the enlightened one. He stands at a strange three-legged table, 
but on top of that table, he has united a wand, a cup, a sword, and a disc. And we understand that those are the suits of the tarot. We understand, if we do a little more research, that those suits do indeed stand for the four elements. The tarot researchers are familiar with that, that they represent fire, water, air, and earth. And if you do a little bit more homework, we conclude that these four elements relate, in fact, to the four types, the Jungian types of sensation, intuition, um, emotion, and intellect, or thinking. We understand that now. People have researched this. But in my work, I also like to show that these four um, implements also represent the four arts, the four arts themselves that need to be unified. The Magus is number one. He's the first card. How can you unify consciousness when the tools that are meant to bring that about are not themselves in unison? First, we must unite the four disciplines, and then we have the pristine um, archive of knowledge. We've got the mystery school in which we can now enter in order to matriculate. But magic also involves the awakening of symbolic literacy, pattern recognition. The idea that we realize that there's other forms of communication and not just language in the world, not just words. And the words are very important, so are numbers, but so are colors and vibrations and rhythm and sound and the ways of nature. And how to decode that? We're referring to that as symbol literacy or pattern recognition. As Alistair Crowley said on the subject, it will soon be admitted on all hands that the study of the nature of things in themselves is a work for which the human reason is incompetent men will then be led to the development of a faculty superior to reason, whose apprehension is independent of the hieroglyphic representations of which reason so vainly makes use. So he's talking about, in his time and the future time to come, the holism of the brain, the, re, in, the revivification of the act of uh, symbolic representation, but not just as any old artist does it, going into the depth of it, because in the Book of Symbolism, there's a master chapter, and that master chapter is the chapter of the tarot. And speaking of magic, there are many levels of magic. There's the magic that happens all around us, and there's a magic that happens inside of us. Let us consider a few points. We say we remember a dream, but surely we were unconscious when we dreamt. So, what part of us was watching the dream? Is dreaming a conscious activity after all? Are we the thinker or the thought, the dreamer or the dreamed? What we don't want to see about ourselves, we forget to think about, and then forget that we forgot about it. Is this what makes up our unconscious, all the things that we have forgotten about ourselves and dislike about ourselves? And if it came for a visit, if it returned, would we actually recognize it as ourselves? We question what consciousness is. It seems like a good activity. But who will answer such questions? but consciousness. What we know about consciousness is what consciousness itself tells us. It believes itself to be whatever it wants to believe about itself. Will consciousness give us the truth about itself when it has a monopoly on it? And what if all its knowledge about itself is, in the end, really ignorance? We have convolutions. We have paradoxes in this world. From the side, a circle could appear like a straight line. From the top, a rod could appear to be a circle. How is the one contained in the zero? We know that from the zero all numbers arise. Is one leaving or coming back to zero? Right? One comes out of zero, but ten is one returning to zero. So what is it doing? Is it being born or is it on its road to its death? Which one of two is the original one? A two is made up of two ones. Well, which one is the original? Or are both an original? You stand and gaze into a mirror. The mirror contains your form in its glass and reflects back all there is to see, clearly, impartially, and without distortion. However, the mirror is also contained in you, is it not? It is taken in through your eye and its image appears on your retina, within your brain. You are thinking the mirror that reflects your form. Are you the person in the mirror? Surely the reflection is not the you, but only your reflection. But if it is not real, then neither can you be. But if you are deemed real, then your insubstantial image must also be real. So which one is the reflection? Which one is real? Are both real? Or are both unreal? You are the mirror, and the mirror is you. 
One cannot be without the other. Both exist in a reciprocal relationship. So it is with man and his mirror, the universe. Now it is not the mirror's fault if you do not like what you see in it. If you smash the mirror, is it not you yourself who gets broken? You cannot break the mirror without destroying yourself. You cannot destroy nature without destroying yourself. Perhaps man is about to discover that fact the hard way. Then we have from the Eastern world the concept of maya or ignorance or illusion. This word came to mean the illusion of matter, of nature. It is thought to refer to the material world of karma and ignorance which entraps the soul. In order to escape the trap of nature, aestheticism is required. However, the word maya did not mean this. It originally actually refers to the illusionary or illusionary ideas that one has about matter or the world. That's right, the original world does not mean that there is an illusion that nature and women and shadow and that which is lower is entrapping your soul. No, it meant the mental ideas you form about nature or about matter or about women or about God or about yourself. That is the illusion. It's all homegrown. Now the magic of life is not in the operation of mind over matter, in fact, but the reverse. Mind is the child of nature, the maladjusted and autistic child. But mind is matter, is spirit, is body. The spirit is not trapped in matter because matter and spirit are the same thing. How can spirit be trapped by spirit? It is the plastic and finite mental template which the masculine modality of mind projects onto matter which becomes the prison of being and which confounds consciousness and not matter itself. Our recrimination against feminine nature is to be directed towards ourselves. Consciousness becomes antagonistic and sadistic in its erroneous but deeply imprinted belief that nature is its prison. Now matter changes mind, which changes matter. A blank mind has a thought. That thought provokes action, which has consequences. These consequences, when experienced, change the actions and thinking of the future. We are dancers along the back of the Euroboric serpent eating its own tail. We change a glass of water by drinking that water. Yes, for sure. But that glass of water has also changed us forever. It is the science of, of this kind of observation, which is sensitively aware of how nature subtly and eloquently changes who we are on all levels. That is the source of the true magician's power. It is not the egoistic or egoic infatuation with how the limited and self-possessed mind changes nature. Crowley talked about the holy guardian angel. In the Bible, we talk about the Holy Spirit, the, the comforter, the watcher who looks over us. But we understand when we do our homework that that was Sophia, the principle of the feminine, which meant wisdom. Sophia is the dove that overlooks mankind, the paraclete, the comforter. The Holy Spirit was depicted in ancient, ancient times. The first images of God that are known come out of the Dravidian culture in India. Um, and they're pictures of Lord Shiva, the Lord Pashupati, Lord of the beasts, Lord of the animals, with horns on his head, sitting in the yoga pose with his eyes closed in meditation with the forest all about him. The earliest images of God that exist. Shiva. Shiva, however, was known as the destroyer. Durga, Kali, also are connected with underworld and with severance and with cleansing and with cycles of destruction or more correctly deconstruction. And we hinted at that earlier, how important that would be. And we hinted also that Western man seems preoccupied by the idea of doing, number one, of blaming others for his mishaps, but also that spiritual development coming out of the religions of the world, coming out of Judeo-Christianity, we have this idea that getting to God is a very, very active and almost competitive and zealous thing. You get enlightenment. You own it. You attain it. You work for it. Well, the same way we work for a car, the same way we attain fame in the world. No, enlightenment is not such. It doesn't come into our grasp that way. Moreover, we have to understand that Spiritual life has a catabolic function also. There's a reciprocal letting go, a reciprocal cleansing, just like there is with a garden. You don't just scream at the garden for the weeds to come out. You have to get down on your knees and do a lot of digging before you'll have the perfect garden. 
to empty a room full of trash and to get the air to be fresh. You have to open the window, but you can't scream for the wind to come in and clean the room. You've got to remove the garbage from inside the room and then automatically the natural forces will take over. So it is for the psyche. But we have not learned how to clean our psyche. The shamans are all strangled and murdered and buried. Those who could have helped us heal are all been massacred in a campaign of genocide lasting centuries. So we don't know what the rites and rituals are, but we clean our beds, we clean our plates, we sweep the driveway. But we have lost the ability to clean our emotions and our psyche. So there's an anabolic and a catabolic dimension to spiritual growth. There's a rise and fall in life. There's an evolution and devolution. What the shamans from South America call the nagual and the tonal, or the yin and the yang. There's alchemy and there's physics. There's the masculine and the feminine. It doesn't matter what way you put it. Basically, there's a destructive and a constructive cycle. And in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, what you do not bring forth from within you will destroy you. Jesus said, whoever knows the all but fails to know himself lacks everything. And Carl Jung says, when an inner situation is not made conscious, it appears outside of you as fate. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus talks about the repressed content. He says, when you see your likeness, you rejoice. But when you see your image, which came into existence before you, which neither die nor which made manifest, how much will you bear? He's talking about the unconscious. Will you acknowledge that when suddenly it makes itself uh, apparent with that other face that you've so carefully hidden behind the persona? Now the dark aspects of our own psyche which threaten the ego's autonomy and its vision of itself are repressed. They are also subconsciously projected onto others who become external representatives of our shadow self. This projection occurs as a compensation for the inner psychic tension we feel as a result of the repression. In severe cases, we also process this content through the field of other oblivious victims. Sometimes simple, constructive shadow work is also not enough. Other archetypes must come into play in order for the dark content to be exercised. Now, Western man has made himself bereft of the rites and rituals, the rites of passage, the shamanic methods for dealing with the buildup of dark psychic content. We choose to ignore this and are patently psychologically arrested. Our avoidance condemns the earth and mankind. It engenders psychotic and sadistic leaders and many social deviances. We are going to find ourselves approaching a time of revealing, a time of apocalypse, a time when the masks will be coming down to the amazement and shock of both protagonist and antagonist. The pure need to be ready for this and will need to understand what is happening. It is already happening. In the Manichaean Psalms of Thomas we read, I will uproot the darkness and cast it out and plant the light in its place. I will uproot the evil and cast it out and plant the good in its place. The world shall be full of glory, the earth will be without suspicion, the whole world shall contain the righteous, they of the earth shall dwell in peace. There being no more rebel from henceforth, no name of sin shall be uttered again. The rich ones of light shall rejoice on every side without any grief. That which the living ones took was saved. They will return again to that which was their own. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said, He who blasphemes against the Father will be forgiven. And he who blasphemes against the Son will be forgiven. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either on earth or in heaven. This incredible statement has been mulled over and analyzed by generations of scholars and researchers. It's very enigmatic. It not only exalts the Holy Spirit, but it says that, hey, if you sin against me, the Son of Man, it's forgiven unto you. And if you even sin, no matter how bad on God, it's forgiven unto you. But if you sin against this enigmatic and mysterious Holy Spirit that the Bible doesn't even really go into explaining what it is, it can never be forgiven to you in this world or the next. The sin isn't even described what kind of sin. It just says you sin against it. And it's a very, very serious infraction indeed. But what is the Holy Spirit? Well, we heard that it was Sophia. It's connected to Shiva. It might even be connected to Aleister Crowley's holy guardian angel, the watcher over us, the Egyptian Ka, from which we get the word the Christ. Well, here is wisdom. That third part of the Trinity, God, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit, 
Here is wisdom, the Holy Spirit of the Trinity equals nothing more, nothing less than the self. That is the mystery. The self, that is you. In this tripartite breakdown, yes, what is the missing ingredient? We have God, we have Mary, we have Jesus, we have the world, but what's missing in this all-important religious trinity is you, the self. The Holy Spirit, if you do your homework and decode it and find out and look into this matter, the Holy Spirit is nothing more than you. Call it the Christ, call it the Holy Guardian Angel, call it the Ka, whatever term you want to use. And that is why if you sin against yourself, if you create violence to yourself, if you are cruel to yourself, you cannot be forgiven because it's unto you. It's all happening within your own republic. It doesn't matter what term we give it, what we call it, or even how we think of it. The self should be the most intimate thing for us. It was definitely that which we called the Holy Spirit until the Christians got hold of it, the Judeo-Christian paradigm that wanted to separate, divide us, alienate us, and say, no, it's all over here. In divorcing ourselves from ourself and making the self less important, unimportant, they cause the travesty. They give us this idea of a demonic presence waiting somewhere to judge us after life and some fuming wrathful God in the clouds watching our every move. But when it comes to the self, it really doesn't matter. You can steal it like they stole it. You can make a big mystery of it in order to control and suppress and dumb down. Or we can just decide, all of us, to just scrap it all and start again from the beginning. Perhaps that's the way. Perhaps that's the answer. What do you think? The average human being resides on this planet for a rather limited period of time. Each of us might think ourselves lucky to see a mere 70 summers. Some will see more and some will see less. It is also a truism that the earth does not need us in order to survive. In fact, our very presence has caused her serious injury. But that which we desecrate cannot be destroyed. No matter what atrocities man perpetrates upon her, the earth is destined to survive. After all our tinkering and molestation, and after our expiration as a species, this world will still be turning, undergoing renewal for the next creative cycle. We, the present inhabitants of the earth, exhaust our minds, learning and gaining knowledge, but become great only in connivance and in indifference. What the diviners of old could encapsulate in 22 humble pictograms we seem unable to comprehend through a lifetime of intellection and abstraction. We certainly have made ourselves regents over the earth, but we rule as power-crazed despots, succeeding only in despoiling, subduing, and eviscerating our charge. As our present age testifies, our insatiable urge to vanquish and desecrate propels us headlong, not to the gates of utopia, but to those of oblivion. For the short season that each of us is here, we have but one raison d'etre, one purpose, 
which is to leave the planet in a better state than when we found it. Though each of us has a unique manner of achieving this, few seem bothered about it. Each person has their genius, a word which originally meant guardian angel. As the alumni of the mystery schools have been saying, it is only when one is in the presence of their genius that the capacity for right action comes to them. The genius is the force which brings our own being into alignment and which quells the inner struggle with the ego. The ego is not a negative thing, however. It is our floor manager, so to speak. Overzealous and autocratic, to be sure, but extraordinarily competent and quite indispensable. The genius, or daemon, is the self, and the self is the executive director within consciousness. The self outranks the ego and will therefore be obeyed. Its presence is essential for correct attitudinal alignment and psychic health. When the ego follows the designs of the self, a new architecture of being can begin, one which benefits the individual and the world around them. In attending to this purpose of leaving the planet in a better place and in a better way than when we found it, we will, however, almost immediately find ourselves in rivalry to those adversarial agencies who have the diametrically opposite agenda and who seek to leave the earth in a worse condition than it was before they entered it. To be able to attend to our exalted purpose and defeat our rivals in the great game, we must be able to put aside external authorities, the projected representatives of the implanted lower ego, and realize that man is his own priest and woman her own priestess. The high arts of hermetic divination remain the means for becoming initiated into our august roles as custodians of being and of the earth. They are our sacred alternatives to the debased and tyrannical religions and sciences that have been our lot from the industrial age onward. I hope that I have presented enough information here to demonstrate that in our flippant and violent attitude towards the natural order, we have proven beyond all doubt the truth of the passage in Omar Khayyam's Rubiat that we ourselves contain both heaven and hell. Nature suffers because our inner psychic deremption is so systemically unbearable to us that we have each disowned it by projecting it externally, vomiting it out onto the external world, our own psychic, phrenic scission, and then devising the myriad labyrinthine religious and philosophical fallacies to afford temporary and partial alleviation to our existential malaise. In our noetic and ideological delirium, we do not seem to care that our once beauteous, immaculate planet is poisoned by our dark thoughts and actions and is desecrated daily through our chronic neglect and abuse. We seem to be unable to see the contradictions that we have inherited since the industrial age or question the logic of those who, while musing endlessly on the curse of Adam and sins of Eve, seek union with the dark archon at the center of their psychosis rather than with the lustrous goddess lying before their voracious and haunted eyes. Our imperious masters play the game of the world as we would play a game of chess. They consider us their disposable pawns and allot us one square apiece on the great board. The strange and significant truth is, however, that though the pawn can move only one square at a time, so can the king. The king's moves are, in fact, terribly restricted and are likewise entirely dependent on the moves of the other pieces around him. Pawn and king are equally restricted or free in their relative movements. Moreover, the pawn can own, if he chooses, the square upon which he stands and be king within that square. He may not be sovereign over the whole board, but he can be sovereign over the area allotted to him, which is the microcosm of the entire game. A single course of a pyramid is, practically, the entire pyramid. A single square on a chessboard is, practically, the entire board. Those who have made a deep study of nature, sacred geometry, art, martial arts, or quantum science know the truth of this. It was this kind of reciprocal thinking which distinguished the Gnostic shamans and mystery school adepts of the past. In our times, it is unlikely that true solution think will become a reality or be applied until these principles are once again actively contemplated and understood. What the humble pawn must understand 
and understand as if his life depended upon it, is that from his one square kingdom he can ensure his own survival and even master the game. It is his pawn think which entraps and leaves him open to the subtle and not so subtle controls imposed upon him from the outside. The black and the white, that is the good and the evil, may be constants outside the pawn's immediate control. However, his attitude towards these realities is within his control. Knowing this, our humble pawn can, like his conniving masters, also play a game of deception. He can appear to move at the behest of his superiors while moving ever in accordance to his own will. He can wear his royal robes beneath a cloak of gray until he arrives at the place of final confrontation. Then, at the appointed place and time, he can then throw off his outer raiment and stand victorious with the sword of Mars in one hand and the crystal scepter of Venus in the other. He can ride forth against the gluttonous dragon on his mighty steed and, with his dread lance, pierce its vile and empty heart, freeing the fair and blessed damosel whose favor he has kept close to his soul to the longest of hours and the darkest of ages.